recently. Uh, that's uh, it's a real celebration at these events. And it's also fantastic to welcome those who um, who are joining us online and understand that there are some uh, colleagues of Philip with very long acquaintances. So it is fantastic uh, to have you uh, joining us uh, with us wherever you are zooming in. So refer to my notes, there is quite a lot to say about Philip McCann. He has a long and distinguished uh, and impactful uh, career, both as an academic and as a, as a policy advisor. So uh, Philip uh, joined us almost a year ago in July 2022 as chair in urban and regional uh, economics. Affiliated to the Productivity Institute here at Lines Manchester Business School. He's one of the world's most highly cited spatial economists and economic geographers and has won eight uh, international awards for his research, including in, 19, in 2019, the ERSA European Prize in Regional Science. Prior to joining us, uh, Philip was Professor of Urban and Regional Economics at the University of Sheffield Management School and was also an Associate Faculty Member at the Blavatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford and an Honorary Professor of Economic Geography at the University of Groningen. In addition to his university uh, work, he was formerly a special advisor to two EU commissioners for regional and urban policy, an advisor to four directorates within the OECD, and an advisor to government ministries in the UK and elsewhere. So you realize now why I had to write all of this down. Such an extensive and distinct career. Doesn't stop there. Philip was also a member of the commission on the United Kingdom's future consultation on economic devolution chaired by Prime Minister Gordon Brown. Now, to give you an insight into the areas of his research focus, those primarily lie in the area of perception uh, between economic geography, corporate governance and Brexit. His research interests focus on topics such as multinational corporations, Space and spatial politics and globalization. And his 570 page book, which I think may reference uh, later on in his talk, The UK Regional National Economic Problem Geography, Globalization and Governance, published in 2016 by, by Rutledge, is the most detailed and comprehensive analysis of the UK's regional economic problems ever undertaken. Now, in order to interrogate and quiz uh, Philip, and we're delighted also to have with us uh, this evening, uh, Professor Richard Jones, who is Professor of Materials, Physics and Innovation Policy here at the University of Manchester, and is also <laughs> Vice President for Regional Innovation and Civic Engagement. He also is a co-investigator uh, and collaborator at the Productivity Institute. Just to give you a few uh, words of insight into Richard's extensive policy engagement and career also. He's an experimental physicist and has been uh, writing extensively about science and innovation policy, authoring more than 190 research papers and three books. In 2006, he was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society and in 2009 won the Tabor Medal of the UK's Institute of Physics for his contributions to nanoscience. So, a distinguished um, inaugural lecture and a distinguished um, chair <coughs> going to lead as in the questions afterwards. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Philip for his inaugural lecture. Please welcome Philip to the Thank you very much, Philip. 
Is there a clock? I think I'll go with my one. Let's check with my watch. Well, thank, thank you very much for, uh, for hosting this and, and, and Richard for chairing the discussion. I really appreciate it. I'm, you know, I'm still new kid on the block here. I'm still getting to know my, my way around the, the school and the building and everything. So what I'd like to do is kind of tell you a little bit about some of the kind of things I'm doing, I've been doing recently, places <laughs> discussions in the UK. Um, so I think a bit of, a bit of background. Um, so I spent about half of my career outside of the UK. So this is the sixth country I've worked in. And that's shaped how I think about stuff. And today I'm going to talk about issues about the UK, but actually I came to UK issues very late. I mean, until I, until I, uh, until I wrote this book, I was trying to explain the nature of the UK regional productivity problem. Um, I probably only published about eight or nine papers on the UK over you know, more than 20 years. My, my work's been based on lots and lots of different countries, and then also not in any context, just purely analytical stuff. It's, it's not related to any particular context. So I, I came to the UK issues quite late, um, but my thinking on these things were very much shaped by my experience of working in different countries and also interacting particularly with international organizations, most, most importantly, the, the European Commission, where I was a special advisor, which is a non-political role. It's a technical role, and and probably more important was the was the OECD that I still do a huge amount of work with. So it shaped how I think. You see, so what I want to do is just you know, kind of give you a thumbnail skirt of things I'm thinking about in terms of the UK. I'm writing a lot of papers about <laughs> issues at the moment, amongst other things, and try and give you a sense of how I think about these things. Hopefully, then it may be able to connect with with things that people are doing. So the way I, I look at talking about regional things and things, I unashamedly stop at project productivity. I mean, I'm in the Productivity Institute. I'm not, I don't analyze things from a productivity point of view because I'm in the Institute. It's the other way around. I've joined the Institute because that is precisely how I look at the world. And as Paul Krugman famously said, productivity is not everything. You sit in the long run, it's almost everything. Tell me what's a country like, and I, if you, first thing I want to know is what's the GDP per capita. And then you think about distributional issues and taxation, public services, but basically how prosperous is the place? These are broadly the indices. That's how I start thinking about a problem. So whether I'm thinking about different countries or different, different regions, that is the starting point. And that's been absolutely central to all of my work and how I hopefully will explain the, the issues in a moment. In the UK, a huge problem is our productivity growth levels are basically zero, close to zero. Our productivity levels are flat, and they weren't. That wasn't the case. They were, prior to the global financial crisis, were actually very, very strong by OECD standards. So we've had periods where things go up and down, every country's the same. But basically, we had a long period of 20 years really where our productivity growth nationally was very strong. And then suddenly we got hit by the global financial crisis. Most industrialized countries did, really all except from Australia. Um, but what's happened is our growth rates are flat wide, and they've done this for basically 15 years now. So we've really got more than a lost decade. We used to talk about Japan having a lost decade. We really have a lost decade and a half. And the effects of this are very profound in terms of the provision of public services, the ability to fund health, education, all the things that we, in a sense, we not only take for granted, but we expect. That becomes more and more difficult if your productivity growth levels have flat lines. So that's the central issue. So that's at national level. But in the UK, we've also, and this is really what I've been arguing, that a huge part of that national flatlining is related to the economic geography of the UK. It's the regional problem. Now, as I say, I came to this kind of late, but this particular book that Ken just referred to, that has been, it's been read by certainly two deputy prime ministers, I think by two prime ministers, because I've got notes from people, lots of permanent secretaries. I was thinking about this problem for about 10 years. And I gathered a huge amount of information. So in this book, there's over 2,000 references. 
But I didn't set out to argue a position. I did the other way around. I just worked with people who worked with data. Huge number of different sources and nature of different data sets, just trying to build up what the case is. And you know, I believe what happened is that through that process, the, the case kind of told its own story. And so these are things I'm going to pick up on here. And I'm going to show you another example of this, which is genuinely new. So, so we have this problem. And if I go back to Simon Kuznets in 1971 Nobel Prize winner for economic growth, he said there's four kind of countries in the world, developed countries, developing countries, Japan and Argentina. Mm -hmm. And the point was that, and Angus Madison subsequently used the same phrase, the problem is that standard frameworks of thinking about growth just didn't tell you about what had happened to Japan in the post-war era in a positive sense, and the same in Argentina in a negative sense. Argentina. The real terms went backwards six, seven decades, whereas Japan had come out of nowhere. Okay, they've had a slowdown, but they're still a very rich country. And standard arguments just didn't fit these kind of templates. What I try to argue in here is I think increasingly the UK has become an outlier. It is very difficult using standard frameworks to understand or explain what's happened in the UK. And that's a huge part of our problem in terms of economics and also policy response. It's very difficult because it, we are an outlier on so many levels. So the first thing is the UK does have one of the worst interregional inequality problems in the industrialized world. And I was the person that demonstrated that. And there's been a lot of pushback, that's fine. I am happy to stand on any platform with anybody and discuss the problem because it is true. And this is part of the problem. Not only it is true, but we were almost entirely unaware of the scale of the problem. Actually, Gordon Brown said to me a few years ago, he said, why didn't you tell us all this stuff earlier on? We could have done something about it. I said, well, the reason is because the data didn't exist. And that is a big part of the issue. Until the OECD data on cities and regions became genuinely standardized country by country, you just couldn't really explain these things. Now the data tells the story. <laughs> I'm happy to, to discuss that. But the first point is the scale of the problem in the UK for a country of our level of development is pretty much the worst out there. The only other countries which are similar to us would be at much lower levels of development. The only exception here is the Republic of Ireland. That's a complicated, different case. But that's the reality. And increasingly, people are becoming aware of this in terms of politics and social issues. And this is an image from The Spectator back in 2012, which I thought was a very good kind of description. It, it, was, it was actually headlining an article by Neil O'Brien. The, the minister for levelling up is now health minister, who really was much of the brains behind the levelling up white paper in terms of politics. He's a really, really very, very good thinker. At the time, he wasn't a politician. He was in one of the think tanks. But he was one of the first times I read somebody in the political arena and thought, that's correct. I'd, in a sense, come to the same conclusion by looking at the data, but to see it articulated, I thought it was, you know, his analysis was really spot on. And actually, if you start to look at the data, this is what you see. There are huge differences region by region in terms of levels of productivity. But if I show you, so obviously it's London at the top, but if, if you take the case of, let's say, look at uh, the Northeast, what's the North here? You've got a growth here. This is the global financial crisis, it's completely flat. And actually, you see the same pattern if you look at if you look at Wales. Oops. You look at Wales, look at the East Midlands, look at the West Midlands, you've basically got the same problem. And the important point is that national productivity growth depends on the growth of all the different parts of the country. And if parts of the country are growing well, but the other parts are not, then of course the Nats, the national effect net is very weak growth, which is precisely what we see. But what hadn't happened in UK debates, I would argue until this book was published, is that the regional part of that story is simply being ignored. And it's strange that it was ignored in the UK, given the scale of the problem. Other countries where the problem was much less were much more aware of these issues than we were. Now, there are peculiarities specific in terms of the UK context. One of the areas that we are weak on, 
and when I say we, I mean the whole country, in terms of politics, institutions, academia, and as a country as a whole, is that we are rubbish at foreign languages. <laughs> which means we have no idea what goes on anywhere else, except for a small number of countries, United States, Canada, Australia, all of which are gigantic federal states, which are bigger than the whole of Europe plus Europe and Russia, have an institutional structure which is completely unrelated to us and which have an urban economic geography structure, which is also entirely unrelated to us. And what do we do? We copy insights all the time, copy paste, copy paste from those places. Government departments do this. My question is always why? Why do we try to translate lessons from the countries which are actually the least like us on so many levels? The answer, I believe, is because we have no idea what really goes on in Germany or the Netherlands or Sweden, which are much closer comparator to us. Why? Because if you want to understand urban economic development, you have to be able to understand land use planning law in Germany which is very, very technical German. It's not conversational, neither is Swedish infrastructure law or Dutch water management and infrastructure is very technical Dutch. The number of people in the UK who have those skills is almost zero, except people from those countries who happen to be working in those areas. And I think this is a big part of our problem because in some sense, English is a global language. We think that not only everyone understands us, that we understand everybody else. And I think that's really a very profound blind spot. We actually have very little idea what other people are doing. I think this has been a real problem for us. We're always looking to the US and also in the academic world, academics are always comparing themselves against academics from the US. You want to be part of the debates in the US, otherwise you're not gonna get published in top journals. You end up going down a rabbit hole, which is not related to the nature of the problems. So the kind of things I've been, I've been arguing for, I've had quite a lot of pushback from people. That's fine. I'm happy to debate these things with anybody. I have material on this, working with the, for example, I've got a, a piece just published recently with the Ernest Deaton Commission. Um, of, I've got a piece that's just come out recently with the UK 2030 Commission from the Resolution Foundation. I work with the Pissarides Commission. There are people out there at very, very high levels who really understand this stuff. And more recently, a lot of my work has been with people like Paul Collier, endless discussions, many, many discussions with people like Jim O'Neill, Andy Haldane. There are many people out there. And of course, in the Project Civil Institute, people like Tim Penables, Bart Van Hart, Colin Mayer at Oxford. There's lots of people who are really very, very senior who actually are all thinking on the same line. So I see myself as part of that group. And, and then Richard would be part of that, and there's, and there's quite a lot of people I can see here in Manchester who are also in that arena, which is you know, obviously for me why it's so important to be here. But many of the things that are standard in the literature, the UK is not. The regional problem in the UK is not a spatial sorting problem. It is not a geography of education problem. That sounds controversial to people. Again, I'm happy to debate that with anybody. It is not. The gaps opened up long before there were differences in educational attainment. It's not a city-sized problem, kind of urban scale arguments you get in many countries, but it's not. Is it a problem of land use planning? I think there's something in that, yes, but it's not a, fund it's not a fundamental issue, it's part of a broader story. Um, and it's certainly not a cities versus towns issue, which is very popular in politics across both sides of the parliamentary divide. It is not that. In fact, it's less that than just about any other OECD country. The key problem is the UK is internally decoupling. It's been decoupling for nearly 40 years. That is the fundamental problem. That's what my book is about. The economy is fundamentally decoupling into two different countries. And in a unitary governance system, okay, we, we have devolved administrations, but we're still very centralized, even with the devolved administrations. The governance and the economic governance of that becomes more and more difficult, and economic policy has less and less traction because the country internally is becoming so different that having a national policy for any money on lots of national policies now is that if any of them work, it's by chance. Seriously, because of the context in which you're operating is so different. So the UK, 
demonstrates very high interregional inequalities on a whole series of things here. Quality of life, well being in disease, civic engagement, skills, investments in research assets, quality and levels of infrastructure, it just goes on and on and on. And most importantly, life expectancy. Life expectancy for the poorer cohort, the poorest cohorts, the, the, the lowest decile group in the UK between, let's say, London and the Northeast is about the same as between the UK and North Africa. These are enormous differences. Why? Because everything else is so different. That's my argument. <clears throat> These are outcomes which result from basically living in different worlds. And what it gives rise to is what I call a jolly food discontent, which I actually coined that phrase. It's the phrase that the OECD uses, the Brookings Institution in the United States, the European Union. It's actually in some, actually in a lot of official policy documents in the US. I should have somehow got a copyright or a patent and would have helped our mortgage. Um, but I used it in the aftermath of the, it was literally the day after Brexit when I was teaching in the Netherlands and students start coming up to me and saying, what on earth is going on? Well, it's a mutiny as Paul Collier talks about. The mutiny is based on the context of people in it. They think, is this part of, you know, am, am I partaking in shared prosperity? No. And that's, that's really the context. So these things are fundamentally about productivity, but they have profound political implications. So this is some work I, I did with Raquel Ortega and a joint Dutch-British team that we had a big research grant for from UK to Change in Europe. We were the first people to demonstrate that these horizontal axis is the proportion of people who voted leave, Brexit. The vertical axis is the proportion of GDP in the locality, which is directly related to investment and consumption demand in the rest of Europe. The places that voted to leave are the places which are hurt most by Brexit. That's London, has almost no effect. And I've seen in the press there are people quite, you know, saying, oh, London is doing pretty well. People from London are saying that, you know, we've managed to overcome Brexit. That's because the adverse effect was tiny because London is so hyper globalized. Whereas if you're in East Midlands, East Yorkshire, the effects are dramatic. And we've published all of this. In fact, we actually share all our data with the government. So the productivity issues also have profound political consequences. And those political consequences also then have profound institutional and governance consequences. So to give you a kind of a scale of this, this is a comparison between the UK and Germany. So these are levels of inequality in the UK over time relative to those in Germany. So this is post-reunification Germany. So West Germany effectively has absorbed East Germany. So 1990, of course, Germany was much more unequal interregionally than the UK. But look what's happened at the time. This is the UK. And this is Germany. And this is on different levels, different spatial units, different indicators. It doesn't really matter how you do it. You all give the same X shape. So the UK today is more unequal interregionally than Germany was at the time of reunification. Think about that. <clears throat> Moreover, Germany as a whole has a productivity advantage over the UK today, which is bigger than West Germany had over the UK at the time of reunification. So half the UK today is poorer than the US states of Alabama and Mississippi. Quality of life indicators around multidimensional quality of life around the same as Alabama, Tennessee. Half the UK is poorer than the Czech Republic, only marginally more prosperous than Slovakia. Within two or three years, that will have overtaken. I mean, the, the, the case I used when I wrote this book is that about half the UK is poorer than the poorer parts of the former East Germany. But actually, the poorer parts of the former East Germany now are richer than about 80% of the UK. And we have no idea about this stuff. Part of the problem is a matter of perceptions. So the example I use is rugby. This was an example from The Economist. I thought it was the best description of the nature of the problem back in 2013. The, to outsiders, rugby is all the same game. Of course, there's two codes, Rugby Union and Rugby League, which explaining to someone who's not British 
is like almost impossible. The shape of the ball is the same, it's an egg. You run around, you fall in the mud, you put the ball over a line, you jump up and cheer, then you kick it over a set of posts, which are like shaped like an H. You have scrums, you run along, you pass the ball backwards, you tackle each other by knocking each other over. Of course, it's the same game, except for people who play rugby. The rules are different, the training is different, even the players look different because of their training regimes. The number, the number of players on the pitch is different, the pitch markings are different. And all the external stuff, the wraparound, the social, the commercial, the cultural, and the business related activities are simply unrelated to each other. And there are some famous cases of people who play both codes, Jonathan Davis, Martin Fire. But the reason we can name them is because there's so few. It's a safe Australia as well, you know. But the important point is it came out of a geographical divide. It goes back to the 1880s, 1890s, the deal of insurance and injuries of people working in mines, steel work, and so on. But it represented a fundamentally different geography and still does. It looks the same, but actually they're completely different worlds to each other. And I thought that was a really very, very clever description of the nature of the UK economy when you think about the, the place regional context. I think it's about the best description. So part of the problem is we have no idea about who we are. <clears throat> you know, we have political narratives in the UK that tend to swing from we are world beaters to we are a disaster. It's our politics, that's how it works. The key characteristic of the UK is on most economic issues, we're sort of in the middle. We're somewhere in the middle of the peloton, to use a kind of a tour de France. Somewhere halfway down, two thirds way down the peloton. That's more or less where we are on just about everything. There are parts of the UK economy which, of course, are genuinely world leading on a whole range of indicators. You know, I think the UK university system is obviously one of them. I would think the Premier League is one. I personally would think the international news of the BBC would be another. Financial markets in London. And then areas of think, aircraft engineering, areas of biosciences, and so on. There are other examples parts of the publishing industry and so on. I mean, you can all think of examples, but as a general observation, when you look at almost all socioeconomic indicators, the UK is just sort of halfway down the peloton in most things, when you look at the OECD factor data. But the problem is that we don't understand that, so we flip between everything's wonderful, world-leading, or it's a disaster. And that doesn't help us when we're trying to look for comparators. So, for example, you know, we'll jump to comparisons with the US. But then also time, you know, the question is why? Because the gap between us and the US, well, if I, well, if you just take even the comparison between us and Germany, that's like the gap between us and Germany is like the gap between us and the Czech Republic nationally. So why do we look at Germany but not the Czech Republic as a comparator? It's just as valid. Between us and the US on most things, at least in terms of productivity, it's about the same as the gap between ourselves and Turkey. So instead of looking at the US, why are we not looking at Turkey? It's a perfectly valid question. Because how we see ourselves is a function of this cultural narrative, which is also linguistic. It's a framing problem. And it's held us back from understanding the nature of our own economy for a long time. That is what I argued. It also doesn't help us that in the political and media world, you get a lot of narratives. One of them is that regional policy, don't spend too much on regional policy because you're going to be jam spreading, spreading jam. Mm -hmm. But, or we do spend a lot on regional policy, but it's like spreading jam. I don't, I mean, you hear all this stuff. Another one is that London is a motor, the engine of the national economy. You know, kind of cascading effects, trickle down, whatever you want to do. <laughs> Another one, which is a different one, is London's like a dark star, like a black hole, sucking everybody in, all the, all the clever university graduates <laughs> going to London, it's just how it is. None of them are correct. Jam spreading, well, the jam is too viscous and the, the bread is too porous. There really isn't a jam spreading problem. The problem is that there's no spreading at all. It's not a problem with jam spreading. London is not the motive for the UK economy. The decoupling tells you that it's a motor for parts of the economy. That is a fundamentally different thing from a governance point of view. 
And London is a dark star. London does not suck in all the clever graduates. This is nonsense. We hear this stuff all the time. The number of university graduates going to work in London each year is around 50,000. You know, it's less than 1% of the London labor market, 0.5% uh, of the London population. Um, the vast majority of graduate movements are our first go home, go back to your own region, or secondly, you go to adjacent regions. The number actually who move them outside into London is really very small. It's about 85% of the graduate population. There isn't a massive surge, but you hear this all the time. In fact, the outflows in London are bigger than the inflows, and they have been for about 30 years. Interregional migration in the UK has actually not changed in 40 years. Hardly changed at all. But these are narratives that once they get in the media and the politics, it's very hard to dislodge them. Unless you know where the data is, it's really, really difficult. So, really, the kind of you know people moving around, capital investing everywhere, people moving around to the most prosperous jobs. I mean, this the kind of standard economic framework that we think about. The problem is that so much of it just doesn't happen in the UK and hasn't happened for a long time. And this is really a big part of the puzzle. We don't know why. Andy Haldane talks about the UK economy as being a hub with no spokes. Very, very pertinent description. And part of the problem is to do with scale economies. The UK has no scale economies apart from London and its immediate interland. As in urban scale economies, the kind of things that drive economies you know, growth in Australia is driven by Brisbane, Adelaide. Okay, you've got the mining industries, all of that. Fundamentally, it's Perth, Brisbane, Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney. They drive the economy. All the data tells you that. What happens in the Netherlands is the Hague, the Amsterdam, Rotterdam, and so on. This is standard stuff globally. The UK is unique, and that simply doesn't exist. Once you take one out of the equation, you can see it in a lot of data. So these are all the things that we've published. Those relationships, you expect to see some sort of upward slope in each of these relationships. These are different definitions of places, of localities using the OECD classifications. What you see is everything is precisely flat. And the UK is unique in this regard. And my point is out is because of its argument. There's no other country that looks like that. Completely flat. There are no productivity scale relationships in geography in the UK except for London, and we're the only country where that is true. You do the population, you do productivity, it doesn't matter, these lines are basically zero. So part of the puzzle is why. So one of the things I've been working on recently, and we were about to publish these papers, so one is coming out in the next few weeks in a very good journal, and the other one is going to be published in the next few weeks at the Productivity Institute. And we're really very excited about this work. So this is work with somebody called Michiel Dams, who's at the University of Groningen. He was an external fellow of the TPI. <clears throat> and Paolo Veneri, who headed the OECD Urban Regional Data Sets, he's just moved to the Grand Sasso Institute in Italy. And Richard Barkham, who's chief economist globally of CBRE, who are the world's biggest intermediate real estate investment intermediaries. And on one of the papers, also Dennis Hume, also from CBRE, is involved. What we have here are unique data, and we are convinced no one's ever seen any of this stuff before. What we do have is data on real estate transactions. These are commercial, it's not about people buying houses. These are big real estate investments, 10 million pounds minimum, 10 million US dollars minimum. Investing in real estate for offices, commercial, retail, industrial units. And we've got, we've got very detailed information about every single investment. We've got about 40,000 observations across the US, across the UK, across the rest of Europe. And we're in the process of negotiating a contract for more data. What we can do is we can analyze the effects of agglomeration, but through how the financial markets think about it, because we can calculate the risk premium associated with every single transaction. And the way we do it, for those finance here, we actually use a capital asset pricing model, which is the simplest investment formula, but actually it's incredibly powerful in the context of the data we use. What we do is we can plot the risk cleaner associated with every transaction by all the locations. So we can do it for the whole of the US. That's just about to be published in the next few weeks. And we can do it for the UK. So here what we have is London. What you get is two normal distributions. And these are risk premium. And what you see is those which are clustered 
in the central London business clusters who use various algorithms to come up with these. Those investments which take place in the clusters in central London are systematically lower risk than those that take place outside, just within London. And you can see it in these patterns. And we go through all the properties in detail of the data. And everything behaves almost exactly according to a textbook framework. But if you look at Manchester, which is a prosperous city now, in, in, you know, it's certainly turning around in comparison to where it was, there's a lot going on. But what you see with Manchester, there's no difference between inside and out. These data are from 2003 to 2015. What does it tell you? It tells you that the commercial clusters in Manchester are not big enough. Centre of cities have been saying this for a long time and places like that. The financial markets tell you that. The scale effect is not big enough to shift the distribution of risk in favour of concentrated investment. So, of course, the more we get the buildings, you know, what you see when you look out in the centre of Manchester, high rise buildings and offices, the more that this takes place, the more potentially you are going to shift to look to something like this. And actually, we've, we've got all the UK cities done and all the US cities and all the European cities. And the puzzle with the UK, the lack of scale economies is also reflected in the capital market pricing that you get in the investment world. This is the first point. <coughs> then what we do, those of you who are familiar with Zip's law, Zip's law is really fundamental in urban economics, also in biological science and so on, particularly in urban economics. And it's an observation that growth is independent of the size of the city. Growth, it's not productivity levels, but expected productivity growth rates and population growth rates are independent of the size of the city. It's an observation that's been understood for nearly a century. And then when you get random shocks, which are independent of the size of the city, on a non-random distribution of cities, what you get is a non-linear outcome that has very specific properties to it. And it's a really kind of cornerstone of a lot of urban economics. What we show is that that is true in financial markets of cities. This has never been shown before. What you get is when you do all the risk pricing of cities using the capital asset pricing model, different uh, risk premium, for example, or the beta values, those who know what I'm talking about here, what you get is that all of those slopes are exactly zero, exactly zero, precisely what zip floor would tell you. So then what we can do is we can look at the changes in these things pre and post global financial crisis. What happened is this. So all of these values are zero, exactly as a textbook model. In the period before the global financial crisis, when there was a lot of liquidity in the markets, the markets could price investment very well. And that was a period that places like Liverpool, Manchester, Newcastle started to pick up, started to catch up somewhat. In the global financial crisis, what happened was investors lost the ability to price anything because the markets went into chaos. So instead of having investments that sort of follow a textbook type of trend, pricing models became completely, almost entirely random, completely orthogonal to any systematic textbook type of framework. Investors had no idea how to price anything. So what did they do? They panic. What happens in panic is you get complete shocks to the risk premium that the financial markets put on different cities and places. So this is what happened in the UK. The risk, the, the risk premium were falling through the 2000s as the economy was going strongly, inflation was low, interest rates were low, growth was strong, two, two and a half percent. And then suddenly you get the shock of the global financial crisis and all the risk premium shoots up. And then slowly in the UK, what's happened is these have started to fall. We've all, we've, we've been doing all the US and European stuff at the same time. So this. I can tell you that this is correct. But what it hides is this effect. In London, the shock effect of the global financial crisis dissipated very quickly. And actually, London became less risky in terms of how the financial markets thought about investments in the post crisis era than it was in the pre crisis era. Whereas the rest of the UK went in the opposite direction. What you get is a partitioning. So these are the 10-year 10 10 year discount yields on, on sovereigns. You see how they're falling. The Bank of England's pushing discount rates dramatically down through quantitative easing in the post-crisis era. 
But what you see is all the regions in the UK are following each other pretty much according to a textbook model. And then suddenly you get this explosion and the risk premia measured on all different dimensions are starting to dramatically increase in all UK regions. And at the same time in London, they're falling and falling. Why is this happening? And we get very, very similar results for the US, but the geography is different. So we can explain that. But why is all this happening? Five minutes, yeah. And you see it physically in the geography. This is pre-crisis. The risk premium, how the, how the financial markets calculate risk in investing in different parts of the UK, pre-crisis doesn't differ a great deal. But post-crisis, you get this enormous shock effect. And what you get is a flight to safety, and it's in London. And you get a capital withdrawal from the rest of the country. So how to understand it, when I first talked to Jonathan Hask about this, he was on the Monetary Policy Committee, and of course, one of the members of the TPI, the first thing he said was, ah, it's the Japan flight to safety. What happened in the global financial crisis? Investors were pouring billions into Japanese government bonds, even though Japan hadn't grown for 15 years. Why? Panic, safety. It's like putting money under the bat, under, under, you know, putting it under the, the mattress, under the blanket. And the same thing we found, we demonstrate happens in the US, but in the US it's to all the big cities, and it's only to the CBDs of all the big cities. Europe is a more mixed picture. But basically what happens is when the investors lose the ability to price, they panic, use a rule of thumb, and then you basically put it. You're not looking for yield. You're not looking for growth anymore. You just have safety. And the flight to safety leads to a permanent bifurcation in the perceived risk premium of regions. And this is persistent a decade afterwards. So this is what we argue has happened in the UK. So suddenly... Strangely, if you look at the US, one of the best things that ever happened to Boston was the global financial crisis, because suddenly capital is pouring into Boston at very, very cheap rates. Huge surge of capital into Boston and Seattle. The cost of capital is lower than ever. And anyone who has real estate assets, their leveraging position, is, is their collateral position, is better than ever. Whereas if you're in Akron, Ohio, the cost of capital is going through the roof. But the availability of capital is just a tsunami effect away from you. And if you have any leveraging position, collateral based on real estate, that's just deteriorating dramatically. That's what's happened in the UK. And it suddenly means that when we think about investment issues, what's the shocks to the UK economy, then these are very real. And actually we can track, this is all pre-crisis, no relationship, zips all is all correct, post-crisis. The greater is the increase in the, in the perceived risk premium over and above the discount rate of the Bank of England, then the greater is the adverse effect on the regions. And that we are arguing this is precisely what's happening in the UK now. So this is something we think is very, very new. We haven't seen this anywhere. And um, this is kind of where, where I'm going to be going now, where we're going for the next, the next few years, hopefully with more data. But that's the kind of power of trying to attack these things. I'll stop there, OK? Thanks very much, Phil. I mean, a fantastic example of an action that's absolutely made policy weather, both in the UK and internationally. I mean, you know, we're seeing a real cross party consensus about the problem of regional. You know, I know in my own work, I've used Philip's work really extensively. So, uh, um, I, I, I think I get to, to, to ask the first question. I think it's okay. Well, people think of questions. Uh, so, so, you've written about the kind of relationship between. Uh, economic uh, inequality and kind of governance arrangements. And we've been through a whole cycle of part party changes of governance. We've had RBAs, we've had uh, various engines and powerhouses, and, you know, uh, their own combined authorities. And you worked on the Smith, uh, um, I'm going to call the Brown point, uh, uh, with you know, quite a lot of. Uh, um, Interesting thing to say. What do you think about the next stage in the politics of, uh, of um, regional governments? What's gone wrong in the past? Well, I think I think if I think in terms of politics and the party politics, I, I just have no idea. I mean, I, I really don't know where things go. You know, I was I was on Gordon Brown Commission. It was a fantastic experience. 
I maintain I'm an independent member, I'm not involved in party politics. Um, but there is a political problem, which is a governance problem, that I think is central to the UK, <clears throat> all of this stuff I'm talking about. And it's this point about if internally you have a country which is very unequal, then a national unitary type governance system is about the worst fit you could have. Because whatever you, whatever the policy is, whether it's environment, skills, innovation, policymakers have got a construct in their head of what the place looks like. Now, if you're in the Netherlands, a small country, or a small country like New Zealand or Finland, or a huge country like Japan, that's not difficult because every region is so similar to each other on all social, every socioeconomic indicator. So when you have a concept of what a place looks like, the national is simply the aggregate of all of those. So if, it, if a policy is designed well in Japan, if it works well in the south, in Kyushu, then 2,000 kilometers north, it will work more or less the same way. In the UK, that's simply untrue. So the starting point is we have a national polity, which is very, a very highly centralized unitary system, very top down, where that policy, the heterogeneity is so enormous that, as I say, I, I think half the time, the chance of anything working is, is almost like, my goodness, it's, it's a fluke because, because, because it's so heterogeneous. And it seems to me the central problem is that we have a governance system that's really good. And this is independent of parties. If you have a governance system which is pure period, what it means is the center learns nothing from the local. The citizens are here, the businesses, the communities, the interest groups. None of the knowledge that they have goes up into the system because it's just a constant congestion problem at the top. So what you get is a small number of key think tanks, a few important businesses, a few media outlets. They're the only people that basically get any traction at the top. And they always get the same traction. So that always disincentivizes people not to engage, which I think is one of the reasons why we have one of the lowest levels of civic engagement in the OECD. And it's very regionally heterogeneous. <laughs> and also our trust in central governments is 34th in the OECD. We're below Italy, Portugal, Greece, Brazil. Imagine that. We are one of the most centralized countries in the world with one of the lowest levels of public trust in central government. And I think the key problem is we miss a middle, there's a missing MISO level. You know, we need to transform from an, a, a pyramid, an inverted V, to an A frame. And other countries find ways to develop that MISO level. Large countries primarily do it through being federal. That's the Australia, US, Canada, the ones that we look to in, for inspiration for, which already have done all that. Germany, of course. Or unitary states which have massively decentralized in the two big cases of Japan and France, which have both been decentralizing for between 30 and 40 years. And they're about two and a half times more decentralized than we are now. And the other group are the small countries that solve the problem by flattening the pyramid by being small. That's the Alicina argument. You know, places like New Zealand, the Republic of Ireland. You know. We are caught in the middle because we have a governance system which is appropriate for a very small country. And we need to build this, and whichever political parties in power have got to deal with this challenge. There's no way out. We're in a trap now. And I think it's a very, very profound trap. We need to develop political systems where the local genuinely drives the national. And we've, we've got to buy the bullet somehow. Whether it's going to take place, that's a different issue. We do have time. <laughs> so, so so expanding on that, so it seems to me it's not just a matter of government control, it's also a matter of corporate control. One of our problems is that we allow businesses to be taken over quite easily, and then they tend to be concentrated in their real ownership and control of this country in London, right? So that you get this muting effect. I mean, if you think about a country, a, a, a city like Manchester, ask yourself which, which are the biggest businesses run out of Manchester? And apart from two football clubs, which I was quite difficult to think of, them, right? This is our second city. And yet, we're looking at the new dish from Auckland. So, I was just wondering whether you know, you've insight into this, this issue about concentration of corporate control, whether that's been a bad thing for, uh, for the UK. So, one of the people I work with is Colin Mayer, who was the first founding director of the side business group, Oxford. He's professor of finance. He's just retired. He's now professor at the Blavatnik School of Governments. And I work with Colin, I write papers with him. And he argues exactly your point. 
and he's, he looks at examples from other countries, or the European countries, but also other countries such as the United States, where corporate governance rules are completely different. Takeover rules are completely different, particularly around family businesses, uh, preferential shares and so on. There's, there are fundamental differences that we kind of ignore. And one of his arguments is precisely this, that the centralization of two things have been basically pernicious in terms of the issues I'm talking about. It's the centralization of corporate control allied with the centralization of the banking system. It's the two things go hand in hand. So if you think about the growth of cities like Manchester, Leeds in the 19th century, along with cities like Baltimore, Pittsburgh <coughs> in the US, the institutions and the assets in those cities were primarily financed locally. And the building of the institutions and all the things that go with them, including things like the planning of civic design, parks, public spaces, a sewerage system, street lighting, all of these were locally designed and financed. Now, there were risks associated with this, and there were some severe banking crises that, that led to decisions about centralizing a lot of these things. But other countries have managed to resist a lot of those pressures in a much better manner than we have. So local and regional economies, you know, for example, most US cities have their own stock markets. Mm. Why is that important? Because the investors in those places have an incentive to look for entrepreneurs in their region. That's their patch. So I always think, you know, people have said to me, what, what do you do about places like Blackpool and Blackburn? For me, the answer is you need to build the capital markets in Manchester. Because if entrepreneurs in those areas are looking for finance, if you've got the deal makers in Manchester tied in with local stock markets, it's in their interest to search out those intermarginal leaderships. The guys from London are not going to be doing that. That's precisely the Manchester margin. That's how the US economy works, as you know. Local finance is extremely important, and you've also got the local banking system that support that. So there's a big focus on SME funding. Germany has the same thing with the Landes Bank and the Sparkers Bank. Sweden has that with their relationship banking models, the kind of handles banking. So, so corporate governance and financial governance are two sides of the same coin. That's very much Collins' argument, and he's written books on this. Stuff. And I think it's absolutely central because it, it's really about, you know, if you're, a, if you're a young entrepreneur, you come out of university, you've got a really good idea. Who do you go to? You know, in Sheffield, where we were, none of the, none of the big... Consulting companies, they've all left. Where's the mentoring ecosystem? Where Paul Collier, who I work with all the time, says, you didn't go next door in Oxford. You just talk to people on the street. There's so many people with those skills, uh, financial advisory, legal understanding, that young graduates who've got ideas for entrepreneurial startups, they are just a wash in terms of an ecosystem of people who can advise them. Other parts of the country, it's completely the opposite. And so if you turn the argument around, why do you get these shock effects in capital asymmetries? I would argue it's precisely for these reasons. In the end, the markets deep down know that you're talking about different worlds. You need to build or rebuild those financial and corporate ecosystems to have exactly what you're saying. We don't look like Germany. All the German cities have many headquarters of many different businesses. Even the Swiss cities do. We don't have any. Question there. Now, there's some questions online. Yeah, yes. So let's have a quick question behind and then we'll come to you. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, my name is Matt Davis from the Institute of Place Management. I really love to talk. Um, um, I just wondered um, the frustration of coming out of the bank office and speaking to actually for solutions immediately <laughs> once you finish doing the analysis. But do you have a, an instinctive feel for the sort of scale of magnitude of work or investment it would take to bring? differential and risk premium back to some kind of level because i just thought there was some talk for the past couple of years and longer about um pension funds investing locally and some percentages thrown around is that are we talking to the sort of level of impetus there or are we is there a much broader conversation uh, at a time where we think about getting rid of leps and, and another sort of you know, markers of those MISO level organizations. I wonder if you've got any thoughts on that. Well, the calculations that we've done for the UK that we'll be publishing very soon, you're looking at differentials between 50 and 80 basis points. Right. These are enormous differences. If you don't think about the international markets, these are dramatic differences. So one of the things I think about is when you think about government policy, you tend to think about who gets what funding and all the rest. 
I would turn the argument around because for me, the fundamental question is always, what will it take to get the markets interested in doing the heavy lifting in this place? You know, who, are the, who, are, who are going to be the investors and what are they going to do? So you've got to have a proposition which is attractive for them. And of course, you know, the kind of places that I'm often thinking about are places where you've got a profound first mover disadvantage. Tony Bennett's talking about this in his own in all group. Because you know, just you know, land clearance in Sheffield, you've got to clear city centre blocks, which are derelict. It's a huge amount of money, there's an enormous amount of risk. And if it does it goes well, you don't appropriate all the benefits, you've got these externality problems. So you've got to think about what would it take to get the the financial markets to move it. So I would think about government policy by turning the argument around. I would use this kind of methodology to calculate what is effectively the wedge in terms of the basis point difference between where we are today and what the markets need in order to persuade investors to go in. And I would work policy design starting, in other words, it's completely back to front of how the political or the institutional machinery works. I would do it the other way around. I would ask that question, what does it take? What's the wedge to do this? And then the question is, is it doable? Well, of course, lots of people say, oh no, this is too much money, taxation, blah, blah. Germany is spending around 70 billion euros a year for 30 years. So in the UK, if you think about what is genuine regional policy expenditure, I don't mean local economic development, I mean really tilted to help the weaker places. It's, a, it's never been more than about 5 billion a year, and it's often been a lot less than that. Something of that order. Germany's been spending about 70 billion for 30 years. And now East Germany is richer than about 70 or 80% in the UK. With no national loss of productivity relative to the UK either. Now, of course, I'm not saying everything is based out in Germany, but it gives you a sense of the scale of the magnitude of what's involved. Thank you. Yes, yeah, this is related to that last question actually. Um, what policy changes could be implemented to normalize this premium across the regions? Kind of hard, hard to sit there before. Yeah. Well, well, I think that I think one of the key things is that the scale of regional developments as a policy has to be increased dramatically. So the UK 2070 Commission, they were modestly recommending about a 15 billion starting point. Well, of course, that's still very small relative to the kind of German type of framework, but they were saying that, that as a minimum 15 probably scaling up to 25 to kind of get those kind of funds targeted, the scale of the funds, because that's the kind of monies you need to get the financial markets convinced that this is serious, that we can be part of this. In the sense of what happened in Docklands in London, you need to do that writ large. The point is that there are large amounts of money, but you also need real autonomy of decision-making, not dictated from the center or orchestrated from the center, you need real legal powers to make decisions and to stick with them. And you need an institutional architecture that can deliver. At the moment, you need all of those things. It's not just about the money, it's about all of those other things as well, which of course is precisely what took place in Germany. So the scale of the challenge in the UK, I would argue is extremely serious, but until the political actors of all parties understand the scale of what's involved and the public also starts to move in that direction, then we're not going to be in that arena. Well, on that note, I know there are more questions, but uh, I think Ken's given us baleful looks. The opportunity to, to talk after this, I think, at the moment. Yeah, so really, uh, I'm sorry about cutting this fascinating discussion short, but uh, some people will have other commitments and will need to leave. Please do join me in thanking both Philip and Richard for a fascinating uh, inaugural. Join us just outside in the Hyde area for some refreshments uh, and to continue the discussion there. Um, before you leave, just notice of our next original thinking lecture, which will take place on Wednesday, 28th of June, here in the business school. And the presenter will be Nadia Papa Mikhail, Professor of Management Sciences, who will explore from Chernobyl. The chat, 
decision making in the age of AI. And I hope that you'll be able to join us for that fascinating pending inauguration mm -hmm. lecture. So please do stay and continue the conversation just outside my